As I said, sorry, this is uh, Gotham Guide, and the idea is to be playing games... Uh, let me start with, with a Sicilian. To play games at the 1000 level, um, to notice what people are playing, different openings. It's not really a speedrun, it's just to familiarize ourselves with what we need to play at what level of chess. So my opponent's playing, you know, normal standard stuff. We've both taken the center. This is not an accurate move against the Sicilian if you're going to play c5. It's because e6 comes. And, you know, the real problem with this is that now, now you know, d5 is coming. My opponent plays d4, playing a move in the center. Um, I can take that. And now if the knight takes, it's actually not always good to force the queen out. Because even though the queen is out here, you can't really do anything about that right away. So I'm just going to develop another piece. Uh, generally, you know, the queen being out here is not good if the knight can hit it. But at the same time, if I trade off my knight, then that's not going to be particularly great either. So he takes on c6. I'm going to take like this. If I take with this pawn, the queen comes in and takes. Queen f3 is a weird move. Um, you know, when in doubt, you can either keep developing or immediately attack the center. Personally... Right now, I like this move a little bit more. Uh, if I just stay passive, that's probably also fine. Uh, now it's better for me probably to take like this. Uh, because I need to keep my central pawns intact. He gives me a check. Nothing complicated here, just blocking with the bishop. We're probably going to trade, so I'll pre-move. Uh, what? That's a free bishop. You know, these one-move captures, maybe he thought he had this. You know, because a move ago he did. A move ago he actually did have that. But when he moves his knight out, alright, let me just keep developing. Every move we're also looking at checks, captures, and attacks. So we're looking at, alright, he's got some sort of pin here. Uh, what if I just get out of that for a moment? I'd rather not be, not be pinned. Okay. Down a little bit on time. Rook d4, does that attack anything? Not really. So let me throw in my attack here on his bishop. Maybe he'll take and maybe he backs up. Okay, takes, takes. Now I'm attacking his rook. Does he see it? Is the question. At this level, that's a very clever move, actually. Uh, because he does have this. A th this is a threat. He is pinning me. But I'm going to throw in a tricky move of my own. If he takes my bishop, I can take his rook. And he didn't see that. <laughs> so... There you go. Uh, that does not get the queen out of danger. Okay, so a lot of one-move blunders that we're seeing from this gentleman, right? Uh, and now we have a completely winning position. So how do we win? Let's simplify. Let's get the rooks off the board. That's a lot easier. And then we gotta get close enough to the king to deliver a mate. So to do that... I need my queen, right? I need to bring the queen with the rook, give a check maybe. First of all, yeah, check, and now that's a free rook. So my opponent has officially lost all of their pieces, basically. Check. And I'm going to put a rook here, pressuring on the B file. Just for good measure, that is also a knight. So every single piece my opponent lost in this game was through one move blunders. Every single piece. In the very beginning, we got, I mean, we just developed, I already said, against Sicilian, uh, which is e4, c5. Bishop c4 is, is not super accurate. He actually played okay in the beginning. I took the center when I had a chance. You can develop here with moves like bishop e7 also. You just need to be careful. Your opponents can attack you immediately. Then he played this, which didn't make any sense. I just took it. Uh, then up until here, he played good. Rook g4 is actually... Rook g4 is a very tricky move. Lines up the tactic here, and I guess he did see that he had queen f6. But uh, upon me playing pawn e5, he just completely forgot that said this happened. So, a lot of one-move blunders so far that I'm noticing uh, at this level. Let's keep going. Let's, uh, let's, let's see if anybody, anybody else out there... Alright, 1017, so around the same. Last time I played Sicilian against e4, this time I'm going to play e6 and d5, known as the French defense. Uh, I'm gonna just mess around with different openings to see what we have e5. So this is called the advanced French He's taking up some central space and generally what black strikes back with is c5 He defends knight c6 now we're gonna have a big battle 
onto this d4 square. Hey! The sub in the chat, thank you so much. Bishop e3 is a bit of a weird move, uh, but he is kind of putting some pressure here. Uh, I'm just going to continue uh, with queen b6. Again, putting some pressure there. Uh, now, generally, taking is considered good. So that I can give him a check here with my bishop. And he's got a little bit of a difficult situation to deal with. He goes back, but let's not forget that this bishop used to do a job, right? So every move checks, captures, and attacks. That's, that's just free. That is just a, a free thing. Now it might get really ugly. Because he might not realize that I'm attacking the rook, which he didn't see. And on top of that, I also can actually just take this first, I think? Because it's check, and then we're going to take the rook. So we're going to do this. And... Then we're going to take the rook. So I was able to get an extra pawn. This technique I like to call boomerang technique. You go back and then you come forward. Uh, let's not forget that the bishop is also still hanging. And when my queen is down here, the pawn is under attack as well. So... Okay. He defends the pawn and the bishop. I can take the bishop. Is it good to trade when you're winning? Yeah. There seem to be no immediate repercussions of that move. I also could have gone knight f6, which I'm going to do now. Just need to make sure that when your queen is so far in the corner, it's never getting trapped. And it doesn't seem like it's ever getting trapped here. So let's just castle. Now, how do you, again, how do you win a position like this? Like, we're up four points of material. What do you do now? Uh, if you don't have a check, a capture, an attack on anything, what you can do from this position is just improve your position. Get some pieces out that aren't out yet. So like the bishop and the rook. That's next. That's the way you continue to maximize, you know, your position. Queen d3. Uh, okay, I mean, I see that there's a rook here. He does maybe have some threats, although it does always seem like my queen is getting out. Let's just move the rook out as planned. Now, if he plays knight c3, I can just take it. Because the rook and the queen line up. So he does that. Discovered attack on the queen. He seemed to have seen that. I'm going to slide the queen back to b2. The queen seems safe. If I had gone there, he can take. It's a queen trade. Uh, I'm winning, but the queen is safe. Okay. Now we see the effect of putting the rook here. I can play queen c3 also. Trading queens is generally good when you are up material. Uh, if you have a big attack, you don't always have to do that. But you can if you want. Let's trade the queens. I can't take that. Uh, but I can go in and attack. So it's, like I said, attacks, checks, captures, all things that we're looking for. He doesn't have a lot of convenient squares to put his bishop. He puts it there, and now I'm going to get my last rook in the game. I keep saying this. If you don't have an attack, okay, try to, try to improve your position just a little bit. Uh, our rook was the last piece not to be playing. Now it is playing, and we are threatening potentially to go down here. So this is just called simplifying. When you're winning in a game, you can simplify by making some trades, uh, which are advantageous to you. Knight e4 is an attack on f2. Ah, so here's a little tactical combination. Uh, I can take on f2, but he did give me this, and now it's a tactical motif. You have two pieces on the same line, and you have a piece that attacks horizontally, and rook c2. And he does not have a way to defend both, and so I will be winning his bishop. He attacks my rook, let's not forget. That is free, though. Checks, captures, and attacks. And this game, uh, the easiest way to win is going to be to make a queen. That is undoubtedly the easiest way to win. But it's going to be a little hard, because he is blocking me in the middle. But I do have one nice trick. Bishop takes b5. And if he takes, this is a check. Now, are 1,000s going to see this? Not always. We could have also won that in a bit of a simpler term. And now just push the pawn. And there is nothing he can do, because he is cut off. The rook is cutting him off, and he can't even come and attack me. He resigns. He could have played on. I don't think it would have been entirely unreasonable to play on from this position. Um, again, uh, you know, he started with e4. Uh, we played just standard stuff in the opening. A French defense, uh, playing just kind of the basics of the advanced French, which is knight c6, d4, and then putting the queen here. And then when we had our chance... We took early, 
uh, and played the bishop out uh, over to b4. Now, in the next game, I might be playing with the white pieces. Uh, and if I do... This game, okay, we have a 1200. A bit higher than we were expecting. e4. He doesn't want to play. <laughs> I guess he was not happy with my, uh, with my low rating. All right. Moving on to the next game, then. Okay, e4. Now we have a Sicilian. I'm not going to play too much theory here. I'm just going to play normal stuff. So, two knights in the center, and then get my bishop out. I need to be careful, though. Putting the bishop here in the Sicilian is not considered very good, uh, because once again, there is d5. But this move is a bit weird. And actually, oftentimes in the openings, if the opponent just puts a knight out, the best thing to do is just to attack it. And that he's letting me do that. Uh, so he's going to go knight d5. And already, you know, when this trade happens, he has some doubled pawns. Putting the bishop here is eh, because he can always just play c4. So I'll just play bishop e2. Just going to... And then castle, probably. Just the easiest. So, c3. Is probably the best way to go. Or d4, just to develop in the center. I'll probably go d4. If takes, just bring my knight out. And I'm doing that to get out my dark squared bishop. That's a bit of a weird move. But now the position is taking on a closed nature. Well, when in doubt, just develop a bishop. Obviously cannot be a bad move. My opponent is a pretty high-rated player, so... What? Uh, I think he just forgot that I have, you know, two things defending here. So again, we're seeing that even at the 1249 level, uh, people are still making these one-move blunders. Now, this is an interesting decision. Do I take or do I move my bishop? Well, if I take, then he's got to take with a pawn. Uh, and, you know, he, because my bishop is protecting. If that happens, he opens his king, which is kind of nice. You know, an open king is good, uh, especially when you're on the attacking side. So bishop h6, he's got to move his rook to one of these two squares. And now, this position is probably the hardest of the entire game. How are we going to mobilize these pieces toward the king? If we try to move the queen... He just covers that, and all these pieces are in the way. Well, here I kind of like this knight h4 idea. The knight to the side of the board to try to come here, which this move actually stops. But the other idea was to play bishop h5. Now we have three pieces involved in the attack, right? So I'm assuming he's going to move the rook because the most recent move does just create... you know, a threat. Maybe he'll let me take. Okay, he actually just flat out let me take. So it's just these, you know, one move mistakes that we're seeing at this level, probably the most frequent. Check here. Looks good. Getting the queen into the game. Also now the queen and the knight both see f5. Now this looks like it's mate, but it's not because the queen is covering. Uh, but I can take this free pawn. Okay, simple, easy enough. And I don't think I'm going to be able to deliver mate with just these two pieces. Uh, okay, I can take, but then this. Let's give him mate in one. All right, that queen used to be covering the, ch uh, covering the checkmate square, uh, but his most recent move to try to trade it completely gave this up, and it's a very common dark squared theme idea coming down here with queen f8 mate. Uh, the most difficult moment was definitely right over here, where, you know, the, the big question was, how do we get the pieces over here? We can't hop in forward with the knight, the bishop is kind of stuck, the queen's behind everybody. Knight to the side, as long as it's a safe move, and you have a direct route back, it's okay to put your knights on the side of the board. Generally, you know, knights on the rim, or grim and all that, but um, it's actually considered completely fine to play like this, so long as you have, a, you know, a journey back. And this most recent move, it's all about these diagonals, right? The pawn move in the center, watch out. A lot of people say they have blind spots for bishops, long diagonals. I can't do this anymore. But the other idea of playing knight h4 was to play bishop h5 with pressure on f7 uh, and, and, and just kind of a, an overall, like a, 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 pretty, a pretty straightforward game, I would say. Uh, okay, this, this guy's 1290. This time I'm going to play e4, e5. 
knight f3, knight c6, just putting knights in the center of the board. He's playing a Spanish. Um, sometimes the idea of this is to take and take in the center. d3, I'm going to play bishop c5, just again taking the center. Uh, he pins me, I'll attack him right away. Okay, he takes, interesting. Um, well, queen takes is obviously the move. Um, he castles and I castle. So, so far, just completely standard play. d6, trying to get my bishop out. That's a bit of a tricky move, because uh, it attacks my queen and this pawn. So, while I would love to stick around, I do have to retreat the queen. It's a very standard king's pawn position. Okay, interesting. He trades his second bishop for my knight. So, a couple quick things about this position. Material is equal, king safety is equal. We both have eight pawns, and eight pawns on each side mean a closed position. Two bishops prefer the position to be more open. To open a position, you have one bishop, two bishops, doesn't matter. You should look for pawn trades. And I'm looking at f5, because if he takes, I get my bishop out, and also my rook file is open, which on same side castling, when you're castled on the exact same time, uh, on the same time, same side. The way you create an attack on the enemy king is very rarely with your pawns, but you can move your f-pawn. Right? So you move the f-pawn forward, and then your rook is a bit activated. Potential, uh, you know, target on f3, f2, f1. My opponent's going for a deep think here. I guess he is, uh, a bit baffled by my f5 move. So now, look, we see the true power of the bishops kind of evolving right before our eyes. h3 is a good move. It's called a prophylactic move. He didn't want me to go bishop g4. Um, I'm obviously looking at different sacrifices. This is a very, very common concept in chess. The sacrifice on h3, which he's not letting me do. So now, let's... Let's double the rooks. I mean, obviously, I'm always looking at, you know, takes, 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 but I can't take anything. That's an interesting move, though. Uh, and he wants to take and triple my pawns. So rather than let him do that, I'm going to slide my bishop back. He'll take, and now at least my pawn structure is better. Having tripled isolated pawns is not very good. This is at least okay. And I'm going to get my last rook in the game. A lot of the games that we're seeing so far at this level, <laughs> he does the same thing on the opposite side. Hmm. Do I want to trade the bit? You know what? Let's do it. Let's trade the knights for the bishops and show you how to play a heavy piece endgame. I'm not calling the pieces fat, but two rooks and a queen on each side is a heavy piece endgame. So pawn weaknesses matter a lot. The weakness of the king is important as well. There's all sorts of attacking possibilities, uh, which I'm going to potentially seek out with moves like rook f6 and rook g6, trying to line up my forces to the enemy king. He goes for a queen trade. He, he's just looking for trades all over. I'm going to create an attack on his pawn because, well, why not? get him thinking. And now I'm going to play rook g6. So I've got my rook lined up to his king. This rook is lined up here. I don't have any obvious threat that I can, you know, employ on him. Uh, but I also don't have any weaknesses in my position. This is the only, these are the only really two things that are weak. Everything else is protected. I'm kind of chipping away here a little bit. If I can't get anything over on that side of the board, I might turn my attention to this side of the board. Uh, he is attacking my rook. Ooh. So he makes a move I can't take. He's attacking my rook. Let's just come back, double up. Pressure here. Uh, well, I can take that, or I can take the free pawn. Let's take this, because it also leads to a free pawn. That pawn. So, rook f2. Takes, takes. And this attack on the c2 square. So rook a2, and now black is just up two pawns. This is a rook end game with like 40 seconds on the clock, but the most important thing in rook end games is obviously the amount of pawns that you have, and also once again we see this concept repeatedly throughout the games against folks at this level. Yeah, it's uh, making past pawns. So, you know, we're trading. I'm up many pawns. I can't push this one, so I'm going to 
Maybe. I can't push this one because he's going to take. So let me slide the rook down one square and push him. Okay, c5 now. c4. And c3. And these are called connected pass pawns. They are the most vicious. Rook and king on the first rank is impossible to defend because of this rook b1 idea. The pawn is guarding the rook. The rook cannot take the pawn because of the pin. And he is too far. If he was here, he could at least go king d2. But he's too far. And unfortunately for him, he goes down. Or he's just going to let his time run out. Which is also something that happens at this level. Folks get upset. They don't want to resign the game. And that's, that's completely fine. Also, my opponent cursed me out in Polish. <laughs> so, my opponent said some pretty uh, grotesque things to me in Polish. My opponent is from Poland. I will not be repeating them for the general audience. We might have kids watching, and, and, and this is only an instructional stream. D4 this game. All right, let's play D5. Okay, e3, knight f6. I don't know what this opening is, but, you know, general good rule of thumb if you don't have any openings is just take the center. And put your pawns out if possible. In queen's pawn positions, it's not good to put the knight out like this. Okay? Queen's pawn positions, uh, you would rather play c5 and then capture so that the knight has some actual pressure. Castles, castles. Okay. We have something pretty unique in this game as well. And that thing that we have unique is the fact that we're castled on opposite sides, which means we'll be able to attack each other a lot easier. Last game we talked about attacking on the same side. e4. The idea is if I take, he takes my queen. But what if I take with my knight? Then if he takes and I take with my bishop, there's no tricks here. If he takes, I win a queen. And then he takes my queen, but I win a rook. So just because you can't take with a pawn doesn't mean anything. That move does have a threat, though. Long-range attack. Alright, let's not, uh... Let's, let's, let's think about this. We can push, or we can just bring the bishop back to block the queen. This is called interposing defense. It's when you play a move... Wow, look at this guy. This guy's, like, really relentlessly going for this pin, so we can't take. But what if I just move out of the way? Anyway, interposing is when you make a move to block an attack. You get in the way of the attack, the bishop is guarded, and with this move stepping out of the pin, the bishop is now under attack. Okay, once again, we probably should not take that, yeah? Because queen g7. But we do have this. Bishop a3. And the idea of bishop a3... Now, you know, you, you can play rook c8, rook d8, you can play a lot of moves here, a lot of good moves. I'm not playing all the best moves, and that also is a free pawn, but I'm not going to take that, because that's just a bit too greedy. When your opponent has a fianchettoed king near the... fianchettoed bishop near the king, uh, a good move to trade... you know, a good idea is always to trade it off. So, I'm trading off the bishop, uh, he takes this, I actually can take that, because it's check. He's going to take back... And then I'm going to play h takes g6. So, again, opposite side castling. I've chipped away at the bishop. That move, no threat. Pawn storm. Very common attacking idea. Pawn storm. Opposite side castling. Launch the pawn forward at the enemy. If he takes, he's doubling his pawns, opening his king. And if he's not going to do anything about it, you're just going to take... So I can't take that. Let's not forget, there's a queen on the other side of the board. And I can't do this either. I mean, I can, but I don't want to trade queens. I'm not winning by materials to the extent in this position that I want to trade the queens. You don't want to trade queens when you have a big attack. So, how can I get my knight in? Knight b4 is interesting, but doesn't attack anything. Knight a5, knight c4 is very strong, though. Because that's a threat on the king, defended like this. And you can take on a4. Queen a3, queen b4, all sorts of different ideas. Now, he does have this move, which is a little bit annoying. And it does take knight c4 away from me. But it is what it is. Ah, but I, I know what he's doing. He's trying to get his own attack. He's, he's going knight g5, queen here, queen h7. 
So I'm still going to continue with my plan, but I, I really need to be cautious here. A very big moment for him. Is he going to go here, here, to the corner? He might think that corner is safe, you know? Uh, but really, at this point, your next move, you want to avoid a check. And, oh no, he played the worst move of them all. And forgot that I only have two knight checks, and they don't do anything. But my queen can go right there. And this knight guards the queen, and it's actually just made in one. So, actually already, he's lost. Because if he plays king a1, I do have moves like queen b4 and queen c3, queen a3 and queen, you know, trying to get here. But actually, this is why you should always look for checks. Queen f6. And queen f6 is force mate. It doesn't set up a mate, it is mate. He can block the mate in a few different ways, but once he goes king b1 at the end, queen b2 is checkmate. So, this little idea, knight a5, knight c4, wins the game for black. And anytime you've got a completely open king like this, you should look for ways to plant a knight kind of directly in front of the king. Uh, if, if possible, really. I mean, if not possible, then, well... That's all right. All right, we've got we've got another game. It's our second game with white. Uh, I think I had e4 last time, so this time I'm going to play d4, and I'm just going to play a London system. If I can get a game, a London system. This is a setup-based opening with white. You play d4, bishop f4, develop all of your pieces in a very, you know, standard and unique way. My opponent has apparently, like, never seen the London because he's thinking already. Okay, e3 is a bit passive. Now, I can't go e4 because he takes, so I'm just going to go e3. All right, bishop d3, which is developing, and castling is next. All right. Now, normally, uh, in, in this opening, you know, you don't play knight c3. Again, it's not always good to put the knight on c3 in a queen's pawn opening. I said this in the last game, uh, because there's pressure here. But other than that, you're not really doing a whole lot. It's actually better to play a move like c4, d4 and c4 together when you play queen's pawn, so that if this capture happens, you know, you, you've, uh, you've got the knight here now, and it is adding some pressure to the center. Also in the future, you can play this. Wow. Okay, very solid play by my opponent thus far. Very, very solid. Um, do we have to take any of these? No. Let me just continue with my development, just bringing the rook into the game. I'm going to see what he's going to do. So he takes. I'm going to reinforce in the center with my pawn. Now if takes, bishop takes. Okay, so he's traded everything. I wanted to trade nothing, and he traded everything. I see that his bishop is attacking my knight. But if I take, his rook's hanging. That's not a good deal. But he might see this and completely forget about his rook. Okay, interesting. Now... What do we have, right? We've got, a, we've got a middle game. We've traded a bishop for a knight, a couple of pawns. What do you do in a position like this? Well, you can attack, right? How do you attack? You can attack the enemy king by, by, by putting the bishop here and the queen here and just launching, you know, an assault like this. You can finish your development uh, with rook d1. It's the only piece you have that's not playing. You can also try to do stuff with knight b5, you know, try to get the queen or go here. And you can also break through in the center. So we've got to look at how we can play with our pieces and how we can play with our pawns. You can also play random waiting moves like this if you don't know what to do. So I'm going to finish my development. You know, I, I don't have a rook in the game yet. I like my rooks here. And I'm putting my rook there because maybe in the future I'm going to play d5. Now that's just a direct attack on my bishop. So I'm going to slide the bishop back here. A little bit better than here, in my opinion, uh, although bishop b3 is completely fine. I like the vision on the king. And he immediately responds to that. He sees the potential danger. But there was a second idea behind my move. Uh, and this is a tactical kind of concept where there's a queen and a rook on opposite ends of the board. And I think here I can play this move, knight d5. So now the queen's under attack, the bishop's under attack, the knight's under attack. He moves the, bi he moves the queen to safety. And guards the bishop. Pretty smart move. Now, you might ask yourself, is it better to take the bishop or is it better to take the knight? 
I'm more of a believer in taking the bishop because again, two bishops on an open board are very, very strong. And also he has a bunch of light squared pawns near his king. So mo a move like bishop g5 is like deadly for him. This very nagging pressure on the dark squares with all his pawns like this must not feel nice. Are we threatening to win anything? Not right now. Uh, now we are. <laughs> uh, that move attacks a pawn, but he forgets about his knight. So he was pinned and he felt the pressure and he decided that he was going to get away. But uh, a pawn is, is not going to do it here. Okay. So maybe I play... Let's see, what's, what's a good move? I have bishop b7, but then he just moves his rook. He can maybe get his queen away with a move like rook c2. I've got a lot of, you know, a lot of normal looking moves here that are probably pretty strong. The so rook c2. Queen b4. Well, if I move my queen away, he takes my bishop, which I'm not I'm not really a fan of. Um how does one win this position? Maybe, maybe we come down and we attack his knight. Let's, let's force his knight to commit to capturing. I mean, making this trade is good for us, considering the fact that we're up a bishop. And now we just need to either trade everything and get into an endgame. Oh, but let's be careful about this move. That move is actually attacking the rook and this pawn. Now, I do have a way to guard both of those things. I can slide that rook back, interposing here and defending my pawn it's an advanced move rook to d8 which attacks this and i can guard that by probably moving my bishop out a square like this now my rook is protecting that messy position and we don't have a lot of time so when in doubt we need to get to his king with moves like h4 and h5 and he just forgets that queens go backwards and hangs a rook. So two blunders, really, by my opponent. He lost the knight and he lost the rook. I mean, other than that, he played a pretty solid game. So, okay, as I said, there's no danger of that move. H4. We gotta open up the pawns near the king. It's gonna be the only way we can win. Well, at this point, with this material imbalance, we can also trade the queens. And... All right. A win for us. Play another. Waiting for a 3-2 game. That game was, was also pretty instructional. Okay, um, I've played d4. Uh, let's also, let's play d4 again. This time, maybe instead of a London, um, I will play a Kali system. So in the Kali system, you play e3, bishop d3, and put your dark squared bishop on b2. All right, so we're just going to play, instead of bishop f4, that's, that, that's, I mean, that's a normal developing move, but he's not... You don't need to immediately react to a move like this. Okay, as I said, the idea is b3, bishop, b2. It's a good move. Uh, it's not really free, you know, because he will go like e6 and take it back. Uh, generally speaking, the queen's gambit stuff um, is... The pawn is very, very rarely a free pawn. But if I go bishop d3, then, you know, he's going to play c4, making me move again. So I'll just go here. Uh, he's pinning me, so this bishop will cover the pin, and now I'll castle. This is a very, very passive system. Do I recommend playing like this? Not really. Uh, but I'm just looking to show you, you know, different kinds of positions and how to think through them, and bishop b2. Again, if he takes, maybe I take with the knight, offer a trade of bishops. Maybe I take with the pawn. Okay, now with this move, I might take. And I'm taking because I think he wants to put his bishop there. I mean, why else would he play g6? And this move is actually kind of make, maybe force him out here. So again, we see exactly like we saw in the last game, light squared pawn structure. This is a concept. Uh, he's got a bunch of pawns on light squares. So dark squared bishop is a very important piece for us to get. Okay, he didn't take back. I'm just up a pawn now. Let me play h3. Just challenge his bishop, see what he wants to do. If he slides back, I can actually trap his bishop, but he chooses not to. Okay. Now, let's finish our development. Rather than blocking my bishop, I'm just going to play knight d2. 
And white is solid. I can't say that white is a whole lot better. I mean, I would love it if I could defend this pawn. But I can't. If I play b4, he just takes. But if I play a3 and then b4, then I think my position is quite nice. He's not going to get his pawn back so easily. You know? Um, we need... Well, that that's just not a good move. Because now b4 comes and hits his queen. Yeah, and he just wasted a move. Now... I moved a couple of pawns up, so now my knight, you know, again, we're always talking throughout this video. If you don't have an attack or a check or a capture that wins material, uh, look for a way to just improve your position. So, knight b3 was just one of, you know, many ways. b6, do I have to take? No, if he takes, maybe I take with the knight. Um, for simplicity's sake, I will just capture. I'm not going to do anything insanely complicated mm, i can take but why would i do that just helping him improve his position maybe i want to connect my rooks so move like queen e2 i've got a look you know he, he does have his queen kind of biting down here maybe a5 is a good move for him in the future um hmm yeah let me play queen e2 and connect my pieces He's thinking. All right. He does have a lot of different ways of improving his position. First of all, a5. That's a great move, just bringing the rook here into the action. Uh, I think I'm actually going to copy him. So rook, F, rook fc8, rook fc1. It looks like the, the opening of the position is going to take place on the queen side, you know, given... Both of our presence in the center. Pawn play, peace play. All these things. Knight d7. So the bishops see each other, but I don't think he wants this, man. Like, I... You know, he's got a bunch of dark squared weaknesses near his king. Alright, very important lesson. c4. Pawn play. Improving the position uh, by using your pawns. You know, it's difficult sometimes, and, and I talked about this a few games ago, if you've been watching the whole time, uh, in a close position, you know, pawn play matters a lot. Knight c e5. What if I just take the pawn? I'm a little bit confused. That opens the rook. Okay, but I, I, guess I just have queen takes here, which I guess he forgot defends this pawn. Wow. Okay, he's attacking my queen. Uh, I don't have a check. I can take his rook, but he takes my queen. If I play queen here, aren't I just counterattacking his knight? Knights attacking queens, very, very tricky concept. Because then the queen just moves, and now the knight's in danger. And he still can't take, because the knight is about to hang. So now the position is getting a little bit more tactical, and we're outmaneuvering him a little bit. We needed to maintain the defense of the pawn on d5, which we did. Because, uh, you know, had we gone here, he would just take back. Um, and queen f4 was incorrect. Okay, he just goes back. But queen f4 was also wrong because then he would go knight d3. So you always need to look at them attacking you as well. Uh, now I do have a check to trade the queens, but I'm just going to take on e6. I don't see a problem with that. Let him take me. And now I will employ the lesson of simplifying. Takes knight d4. This is a check. He's forced to trade queens with me. Uh, and now I just have a two-pawn advantage. e5. I can play knight e6, but after that he just goes here. There's no benefit, so I'm just going to come back. And just bring my king. So again, we had a rook endgame before. Ooh, he gave me the full control of the file. So rook endgames, rook on the seventh rank, or the second rank. Super important concept. If you can land a rook there to put maximum pressure... Immediately, I seize the opportunity. Now white is up by three pawns. We see the two pawns here. Uh, rook trades are good now. Knight trades are good. I'm up three pawns. So just taking this game now all the way to its conclusion. And we'll hit 1,200, which is going to be pretty awesome. He's thinking for his last few moves here. 
and he just throws in the towel and resigns, and we cross 1,200. That was, uh, again, it was a very passive opening that I played. I mean, I you know, I just, I just kind of kept it simple. Just developed, castled in a queen's pawn setup, uh, and then and then just put my bishop out on b2. And, the, you know, the second that I saw him play g6, I decided to make this capture. Had he gone bishop b7, maybe I make this capture anyway. You know, just so I have an active bishop. And then I'm looking for ideas like pawn trading. Just to open the position a bit, finishing my development. It's a very solid position, not a tactical position at all. But the way the game went, you know... Like, he gave me the c5 pawn, he just didn't take it. And the easiest way to reinforce the c5 pawn or the c4 pawn, whichever you take, is just like, like this. It's just, you know, using the pawns. And he just kind of didn't stop me. And then I just slowly improved a little bit on the queen side. And probably the most instructional moment of the game, you know, comes right here. Oh, it seems like white is kind of frozen. White can't push this pawn. White can't push this pawn. White can't make any more forward progress, like with any of his pieces. So he plays c4. And the idea is to chop this pawn down, activate this bishop, and then bring the rooks into the game on the open c-file. Pawn play is super important, especially in closed positions, whether you have bishops, knights, or anything like that. We saw throughout this video that pawn play was, uh, was super important. But for now, uh, we're going to pause here now that we hit 1200. Uh, and next time, we're just going to try to get to 1400 as fast as possible. So something like 1200 to 1350 or maybe to 1400. So um, hope you guys enjoyed.